magnify his holy and righteous name, then you ought to look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, help me to praise him this morning. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. I said, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, help me to praise him this morning. Somebody said, when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul has to cry out, hallelujah. Just look at somebody and say, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Amen, amen. I know I said a couple weeks ago that we are excited about Enon and who we are and what God is doing. And I said that we're the best thing since fried chicken and we ought to be excited about our church. And uh, some people take that really to heart because someone was so excited and so anxious to get into worship, they left their car running. Amen. If, if, if you own a 2007 Jeep, uh, license plate HKD1781, your engine is running. Amen. Amen. So thank you for being excited about worship. Amen. Amen. It's a white Jeep. Amen. So if you run out of gas, the trustees will help you. Amen. Amen. Is that true, Tamika? Oh, bless the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. She is excited about church. Amen. She is. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, please pay attention to the announcements in our bulletin. Several announcements this afternoon at 4 p.m. Look at everybody and say 4 p.m. We have our hospitality annual day. Listen to me, Enid. Listen to me. Our hospitality ministry is one of the best in the country. Amen. Amen. When I when I went back home to Columbus, Ohio to preach in a simultaneous revival last month. Uh, Mount Hermon was the host, the church that uh, came here for the installation. And I wasn't in the building five minutes, and they were asking me about Margot and the hospitality ministry. Amen. So we have a dynamic hospitality ministry. Every time we need them, they are here for us. Let me say it one more time. Every time we need them, they are here for us. Let's give them a hand clap of love. Amen. So they need us this afternoon, amen. Uh, this afternoon they need us, so let us come back and support them at 4 p.m., amen. Uh, thank, let's thank God for this music ministry, this choir today, and let's celebrate them. We're also uh, excited about becoming an evangelistic church. Our uh, Sunday evangelism Sunday, soul winning Sunday coming up first Sunday in June. Let's continue to invite people. It's good to look around and see a lot of people in church this morning. Amen. We are a growing and a vibrant church. I don't know why, but every time I, I keep having these visions of me being an old man preaching in this church, Deacon Floyd, and, and in my old years, I see myself preaching to a third balcony. Amen. I don't know why, but that keeps coming. Amen. Amen. But I'm, I'm believing in faith that we're going to grow. Amen. Good to see a new friend here. Uh, entrepreneur in the community, uh, Carolyn Edwards, a new real estate agent. She and her husband, wave your hand, amen. Giving you a free advertisement, amen, amen. <laughs> new real estate agent in our community, so we want to support our own. Thank you for coming and sharing with us today. There is a word from the Lord, if you will turn with me to the Old Testament book of Judges, Judges chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. Typically during the month of May, uh, I preach sermons around women since it's Mother's Day and we celebrate uh, feminine contributions to the kingdom. Uh, also Sister Thomas has a program coming up uh, called Nameless talking about the nameless women of the Bible the first Saturday in June. Uh, first Lady and some others are going to be presenting and teaching and lecturing and, and we want to come out and support that. Amen. Judges chapter 4 verses 17 through 21. And it reads as follows. How be it Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Yael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazar, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Yael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. 
And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be, when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there a man here? Thou shalt say, No. Then Yael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. I encourage you in your free time, read the whole chapter. It's a dynamic narrative. Amen. All the sisters are saying amen after reading that. Amen. <laughs> Lord, I'm going to sleep with one eye open tonight. Amen. I want to preach from this thought this morning. There is a plan for your life. There is a plan for your life. This is a word for those who have been discounted, overlooked. You, your vision for life has been minimized. But God wants you to know that he has a plan for your life. Heavenly Father, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do and what you're going to say today. We thank you for this fresh word, this fresh oil that is you are about to pour out amongst us. Lord, we pray that this word would lead someone to salvation and covenant relationship with you. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would stand with me and stir up the gift and the anointing that I might be used for your glory. And Lord, I pray that as your word comes forth, that the redeemed of the Lord would say so, that we would give the Lord a mighty praise, that we would receive your word. Lord, we thank you in advance for everything that you are going to do in the mighty name of Jesus. Let everyone say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, ushers, you may retire. There is a plan for your life. The text today presents Israel during an interesting time within their history. We find the people of promise under foreign oppression once again. Their oppression is, was not due to the exclusive acts of the adversary or the devil. However, their demise was due to their own behavior. They once again chose to turn away from God. They chose to backslide. They chose to give their hearts to foreign gods and to foreign people. Thus, God removed himself from them and allowed them to fall under the oppression of their enemies. However, their demise was due to their own behavior. Judges 4 and 1 says that Israel once again did evil in the sight of the Lord. In other words, after the Lord blessed them, after the Lord brought them out, after the Lord did good and mighty things in their life, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. They were guilty of idol worship, apostasy, and injustice toward one another within the nation. They turned away from God after all of the good things that God had done in their lives. Now we find them crying out unto God, asking God for del deliverance and relief in spite of their condition. Thus the Lord providentially allowed them to be placed under oppression due to their disobedience to him. Israel is under the oppression of Jabin, the king of Canaan, and his captain Sisera. They had engaged in a series of treaties with people who had not necessarily been their friends, but they engaged in treaties because they had a common goal of keeping Israel under control. Isn't it interesting how some people who may not like one another will work together for a common goal to keep people down? Isn't it funny how sometimes folk will form treaties with one another just to keep you from reaching your goals and your your vision. Furthermore, this is a unique time in history and within the patriarchal society because we see a female in leadership of the nation, a prophetess by the name of Deborah. She was not only a prophetess, but she was a judge and a ruler within the nation. Isn't it funny how we argue about what women can and cannot do now in 2017 and then way back in patriarchal times, God saw fit to put a woman as a judge, as a prophetess, as a ruler over the... Y'all better help me, women. Amen. 
And we even, some folks even have such a limited view to talk about women can't preach, but here in the Bible, it's plain. She was a prophetess. She heard from God. She spoke to the people. I don't know what more evidence you need. This is one of the rare times in history when females were exalted and accepted into leadership within the kingdom. This is unique, especially during the historical context of the scripture. This was one of the most wicked and wayward times within the history of Israel, but yet the Lord uses a woman to lead the nation. One of the most wicked and wayward and dysfunctional times, but God providentially decides that he's going to put a sister to lead the nation. That's why, women, you are not ever let anyone diminish who you are and what you can do, because there's biblical evidence that when the kingdom was in a wreck and a mess and was tore up from the floor up, God sent a woman by named Deborah to lead the nation and to judge the nation. One of the most wayward times and we find a woman in leadership. This was a messy time within the history of the kingdom. For over a span of 440 years, they experienced five civil wars within themselves. They had 14 crooked judges that exploited the nation. They had nine apostasies, which means nine national seasons of backsliding and falling away from God and a multitude of moral and spiritual failures within the nation, but yet the Lord uses within Judges chapter 4, two women essentially to save the nation from themselves. I ought to have some sisters that ought to look at one another and say, baby, we can do it. Yeah, come on, loosen your collar this morning. Thus, we must never underestimate how the Lord can use a woman in difficult times. The Bible says in the beginning of chapter 4 that Deborah was one that led with integrity, spiritual sensitivity, spiritual authority, and prophetic capacity. Thus, we must never underestimate the role of a woman and how the Lord may use them in a corporate sense within the kingdom or individually to lead up to us to a place of where the Lord can bless us and use us. I'm not ashamed to admit the most critical element in my ministry sitting on the third row this morning. Amen. Hallelujah somebody. Because if she, I need her to cover me. I need her to build me up. I wish I had some help in here. Brothers, you ought to say amen because your wife is looking at you right now. Amen. Don't look, brother. Don't look behind you to get floor. Your wife is looking at you right now. But you ought to say, I need a woman to cover me to build me up. Glory. Hallelujah. As we unwrap the text today, we see the Lord is manifesting his divine plan to restore and liberate the nation of Israel. The Lord raises up a man by the name of Barak, we see in chapter 4, to lead the nation into a battle against Sisera. Barak is a trained military man with vast experience in battle. However, we discover something interesting regarding Barak yielding to the call of the Lord to fight in battle. The Bible says in verse 6 that Deborah called and sent for Barak and she confirmed the Lord's command upon his life and questioned him as to why he has not yet moved at the Lord's word. In other words, she calls him into her presence and she says, Barak, didn't the Lord tell you to go down into the battle and fight against Sisera. She said, Barak, didn't the Lord command you to take 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and Zebulon? Furthermore, she goes on to say, didn't the Lord say that he would deliver the enemy into your hand? In other words, she told him, didn't the Lord tell you that he would give you the victory? But Barak responded to her and said, I will go if you will go with me. If you don't go with me, then I'm not going to go into the battle. Some question Barak's faith and obedience based upon his statement in Judges 4 and 8. However, the theologian Mac Reynolds asserts that it was not a matter of faith or obedience, but rather he valued the anointing that was upon Deborah's life. He understood and he believed that the Lord would indeed give him the battle, the victory in the battle, but he wanted Deborah to go with him because of her anointing that was upon her life. You see, if if the Lord's plan is going to unfold in our lives, one of the first things we must do is value the anointing on people that are around us. We have to understand that sometimes it takes some spiritual praying, praising, worshiping people to go with us on our journey to help us to accomplish what the Lord wants us to do. You see, I don't need any naysayers, no critics, nobody with haterade to go with me into a battle, but I want someone that is anointed, someone that knows how to pray, someone that knows 
knows how to worship, someone that knows how to praise, to walk with me on this tedious journey. I wish I had about 10 Baptist folk in here that can say, I need somebody that has a heavenly hookup in their life to walk with me while I'm on my way to my destiny. Somebody say, preach, Mac. It doesn't matter if you like or dislike someone, you must value their anointing. Barak understood Deborah's relationship with the Lord and the anointing that was upon her life. Thus he knew if the Lord was going to move in his situation, watch this, that he needed to be connected with someone that was anointed. If he was going to accomplish his goal, he needed to be connected to someone that was anointed. If he was going to accomplish everything that God wanted him to accomplish, he he needed to be connected with someone that is anointed. You see, that is a valuable, valuable, valuable point for someone here today because if the Lord is going to manifest himself in your life, you have to make sure that you are connected to anointed people. You see, if you are connected to toxic folks in your life, then nothing is going to ever manifest in your life. You're not going to get anywhere with the Lord, but you've got to make sure that if you are walking on a journey going somewhere, that you have anointed people walking with you. Do I have anyone in here that can say, Preacher, you're sure enough telling the truth because I've been up to my neck in toxic, faithless folk, but I need some folk to walk with me and be connected with me that can pray for my vision, that can pray for my health, that can cover my family, that can help me to become all that I need to be in Christ. I give you permission this week to delete some folk from your Facebook, your Twitter, your cell phone because they don't meet your spiritual criteria because you have determined this morning that God is taking you somewhere and you need some anointed folk to help you get to where God wants you to be somebody say amen, amen. maybe the reason why some people's lives have stayed in neutral is because you are not connected to the right people you're praying you're sowing you're working you're giving but you're still not moving anywhere perhaps you're connected to the wrong people Look at somebody and say, check your connection. If we have determined in our faith that the Lord is taking us somewhere, we have to also determine in our faith that we are connected to going to be connected to the right people. I've given this example many times, but I'm going to give it again because someone needs to hear it. It's just like that space shuttle. You remember the space shuttle? It would take off from the launching pad, and the space shuttle had booster rockets that were attached to the space shuttle. The, the booster rockets were designed only to go to a certain altitude with the space shuttle. And then once the space shuttle reached a certain altitude, then the booster rocket had to fall off because if they stay connected they would keep the space shuttle from going into outer space and it will fall back to the ground you've got to realize that some friends and some folk in your life are just booster people they are intended for a season in your life they help you get off of the ground but there comes a point in time in your journey when they have to fall by the way so that you can go higher and where the Lord wants you to be somebody ought to shout and praise him like you lost your mind because I just gave you a word from the Lord right now that says you need to to let go of some connections in your life that are working against your anointing and your calling. We don't need our lives to be polluted with people that will place our victory in jeopardy. So in essence, Barack was saying, I have been through too much in my life not to have someone anointed by my side while I go in battle. I know the Lord said he's going to give me the victory, and I believe that, but I want some anointed folks with me while I'm walking into my victory. And you see, that ought to be our testimony and our song of praise today, that yes, we believe the Lord is going to do it, but we want some anointed people to walk with us into our victory. Is there anyone in here that believes that you are taking steps towards your victory, that God is taking you somewhere, but you want somebody that's anointed with you to walk with you so that when you get your victory, you have somebody that can praise and celebrate what God has done in your life, and you won't have someone that will try to rain on your parade. Is there anybody in here that needs some Deborahs in their life that will just walk with them, pray with them, praise with them, worship with them, carry that anointing with them while they go into battle? It wasn't that he didn't trust the Lord, but rather he just wanted control of his atmosphere. Perhaps the, the Lord is saying to someone today, control your atmosphere. Somebody say control. 
Control who you're connected to. Control who you tell your business to. Control who you give your heart to. Oh, I'm trying to do some devil killing this morning. Control who you allow to come into your visions for life. Because if you allow the wrong person to become connected to you, then they will kill your vision. They will try to kill your faith. They will try to pollute your atmosphere. I wish I had somebody in here. But when I think about everything that God's about to do in my life, I'm willing to purge my atmosphere of anyone that doesn't have the right anointing because I believe God is taking me somewhere. Watch as this narrative unfolds. We're going to get out of here. The Bible says in verse 14 and 15 that Deborah says, this is the day which the Lord had delivered Sisera into your hands. And the Lord, watch this, it says, discomforted or confused the enemy and the angel with an angel and Sisera fled for his life left his men and the Lord gave Barak and his 10,000 men victory. Watch this. I'm going to give you a shouting moment right here. When the Lord is with you, he will confuse your enemy. Let me say that one more time. You don't, you don't understand. Let me, let me exegete this text one more time. You don't understand what happened. In the beginning of chapter 4, the Lord told Barak that I will give you the victory that the, the victory will be in your hands. And here we see in verses 14 and 15 that before Barak even got to the battlefield, somebody don't hear me. I said before he even got to the battlefield, before he even drew his sword, the Lord sent an angel before him that confused the enemy. And when the Lord just hovered through the atmosphere, Sisera and his army fled for their lives. He will confuse the enemy so that you can have victory in your life. Barak should have been defeated by human senses. However, the Lord intervened and fought the battle before he even got there. The Bible says that the Lord confused or discomforted Sisera and all of the chariots before Barak. That's a word for somebody today before. Before you even get to a thing, the Lord is going to fix it. Come on and help me have church this morning. Before you get to the battle, the battle is already won. Before you get to the surgery, your body is already healed. Before you get to the business, business meeting the deal is already done before you go to the interview the job is already yours before you take the test you've already passed before you raise your hand your enemies are already made your footstool somebody ought to just look at three or four folks and just say before 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 I get there the Lord is going to do it before I even lift a finger the Lord is going to bless me real good before I even break a sweat the Lord is going to put victory in in my hands before I even say a thing the Lord is going to do it on my behalf is there anybody in here that can say preacher I know what you're talking about because I've had a before experience I don't know how it happened I don't know what in the world happened but when I got there the Lord had already done just what I needed him to do the most somebody look down your row and just say before before May I share my testimony, my bread and butter over the last 27 years plus has been watching the Lord confuse my enemies and the Lord could preserve, Lord preserve me and bless me. I don't even have to confront folks. I just remind them my faith by saying before. Sometimes I just look in the mirror and I say before. I think about a situation and I say before. I dare you to high five three folks and put something in the atmosphere and just say before. Oh, come on, encourage somebody's faith and say before. Before you get there, it's already done. I don't know what you up against. I don't know what kind of devils you're dealing with. I don't know what kind of hell's breaking loose in your life. I don't know what kind of sickness is in your body. But God told me to stop preaching right here and just tell you to high five somebody and tell them before. The Lord is already doing it in your life. Before, before, before. When somebody bless me with my new car, I'm going to put that on my license plate before. Let, let, me, let me execute this text and I'm, I'm out of here. Here in the midst of this dynamic narrative, we see the real heroine of the story emerging in verse 17. A lady by the name of Yael. One would assume by the way of the narrative how it begins in the beginning of chapter 4 that Deborah or Barak would be the central figures of the Lord's plan because Barak was this seasoned warrior. He was a seasoned soldier. Deborah was this prophetess, this judge, and, and they made this deal with each other. She said, he said, she said, I will go with you if you agree that victory will be placed in the hand of a woman. 
So you would think as a natural reader at the beginning and the outset of chapter 4 that Deborah or Barak would be the one that the God's plan was centered around. However, what I like is that we discover someone who is often overlooked, discounted, and perhaps undervalued emerges in chapter 4 as the central figure of this text and the one that God uses to give the nation victory. Anyone who is familiar with Eastern battle customs understands that even though you may defeat the soldiers, the victory is not complete until you capture and kill the leader or the captain of the army. Thus we find in these verses we read today that Sisera fled the scene once the Lord moved on behalf of Barak. However, the Lord uses the insignificant to accomplish what was needed for the victory. Let me give you just a few quick principles and I promise you I'm out of here today to understand that there is a plan for our lives. Number one, the Lord can use small people to do big things. Let me say that one more time. The Lord can use small people to do big things. Yael did not have a resume like Deborah or Barak, but the Lord used her. Previously in chapter 4, when Deborah told Barak, I will go into battle with you based upon one condition, the condition being that, that you are okay with the Lord placing victory in the hand of a woman. I'm sure Barak and many others thought they were talking about Deborah's hand. Barak and many would believe that this was a reference to her. However, the plan was not to place victory in the hand of Deborah, but rather it was to place victory in the hands of Yael. I want to wake up someone's faith today and let you know that no matter how small or insignificant you may feel or be labeled, your status has no bearing on how God will bless you or use you. Let me say that one more time because I promise I'm almost out of here. Your status has no bearing on how God will bless you or use you. So you might not not be at the top of the social ladder but that is no indication that the Lord will not blow up your life you might not have the degree like someone else has but that's no indication of what God will not do in your life you might not have the friendship and the connections that some folks have but God can still do wonderful things in your life I wish I had someone in here that grew up barefoot in the south came from the projects grew up on government cheese but now you can go and eat wherever you want to eat you got a good retirement pension plan God has blessed you you don't put your kids through school, you got good threads on your back, you got good hair weave, you can buy whatever you want to buy, isn't God good? Don't tell me that God can't bless you from small beginnings. So that's why I look at the little things in my life and I give them over to the Lord and I say, Lord, I'm going to trust you until the day I die because I understand that you can take small things and make them major in the kingdom. Somebody you ought to look at your neighbor and say, I'm about to blow up right now. Oh, I need somebody with some faith to look at somebody around you and say, neighbor, I'm about to blow up right now. You ought to have some audacity in your faith to look at somebody and say, take a good look at me because this is the last season you're going to see me driving a hoot. This is the last season you're going to see me down and out. This is the last season you're going to see me scuffling and shuffling. This is the last season you're going to see me hustling for my life because God's about to blow me up and do something big in my life. He's going to make me significant. He's going to expand my territory. He's going to make me the head and not the tail. He's about to prosper me. He's about to be my shepherd and I shall not want. Somebody ought to praise him like you lost your mind because the Lord just told you that he's about to bless the small things in your life. Look at somebody and say, there's a plan, there's a plan, there's a plan. Yes, the Lord will use it. This is where someone should ought to holler like you lost your mind. Have you forgotten when folks said you wouldn't amount to anything, but look at what God has done. Have you forgotten how people waited for you to fail, but look at what God has done. Do you remember when people laughed at your vision, but look at what the Lord has done. I dare you, just turn around in your seat and tell somebody, take a good look at me now. They thought I would fail. They thought I wouldn't amount to anything. They thought I wouldn't get the position. They thought I wouldn't get a promotion. They thought I would not prosper. But what they did not understand is that God had a plan for my life. And guess what? God is not finished unfolding his plan. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Let me give you some evidence. Up until now, the most significant thing that Jael had done in her life was to perfect her domestic responsibilities toward her husband. She was a good woman. Her life, her, her daily journey consisted of cooking a meal, 
doing laundry, cleaning the house, first lady rubbing her husband's feet. But now, but now, watch this. The Lord is unfolding a plan for her life. Don't tell me what the Lord cannot do. We see secondly that we must be receptive to the exciting. There must be a willingness to break from your routine. You see, that's why I, I, get, I, get, I, I get disturbed by folk that never want to change their routine. Because I've learned that sometimes the Lord shows up in the exciting. Do I have any witnesses here? Let, 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 me, give you, let me give you evidence here. As you look at the text, as the text comes alive, we find that Jael was out there just doing her daily domestic duties. But she heard a rumbling coming from over the hill. Come on and walk with me for about two minutes and I promise I'm out of here. And the Bible says that as she was doing her daily duties, that here comes Sisera, the captain of Jabin's guard, coming and running for his life across the hill. And the Bible says that he runs to Yael and he says, let me in your tent. And you see, we find here that she was willing to embrace the exciting because she broke from her daily norm and she broke some social laws because it was against the law to allow a man to come into your tent because she could be accused of adultery and he could be put to death for being in the tent of a married woman but she understood that God was up to something in her life and I declare that's what somebody needs to do today that you need to understand that God is up to something in your life you ought to have the audacity to be receptive for the exciting I don't care if you've never done it before I don't care if you've never seen it before but perhaps God can move in the exciting in your life if you dare to step out of the box and let God move in your life in a new way then he might give you something that you've never received before. Do I have a praying church in here? We see in this biblical narrative that Yael lets him in the tent and Sisera says unto Yael I need a drink of water but she understood who he was. She understood that he should not be separated from his army. She understood that he was running from his life and she understood that God was about to use her to give victory to the kingdom and you see somebody in here today needs to understand that the Lord is about to use you. You ought to see something shifting in your environment. You ought to see something shifting in your circumstance that gives you evidence that the Lord is about to move. Is there anybody in here that feels like the Lord is about to do something in your life? Do you feel something shifting and turning in a new direction in your life? And the Bible says that Sisera asked Yael for a drink of water because he was thirsty but watch this theology here she didn't give him water but she gave him some milk and scholars believe that she gave him milk intentionally because she knew that the Lord was going to use her to defeat the enemy and that if she gave a weary man some milk that it would make him lethargic and sleepy and the Bible says that he fell asleep in the tent and she knew that she had to secure the victory and for the nation and you see somebody needs to understand today uh, that you can't put off for tomorrow what the Lord wants you to do today uh, because the Lord is using you uh, and he is positioning you uh, to make a difference in the kingdom uh, and she looked around her can I give you my systematic theology she looked around here and said what can I do uh, how can the Lord use me and she said well all I have is this peg from my tent and I have a hammer here by my side and she said well I'm going to take this peg and I'm going to take this hammer and I'm going to wait till the enemy falls asleep and then I'm going to use what's in my hand. That's my final point. That's if the Lord has a plan for your life, sometimes you've got to use what's in your hand. You ought to tell your neighbor, you ought to use what's in your hand. You have praise in your hand. You have resources in your hand. You have worship in your hand. You have faith in your hand. And the Bible says that's when he fell asleep that she took the peg from the tent and she took the mallet and she drove it through his head and then the nation secured the victory somebody saying pastor that's a horrible story how can that be glorious that she killed a man where by rights of the law he was worthy of death because he had entered her tent and that was against the laws of the
the custom. So either she or her husband had the legal right to kill him and take his life. Don't tell me that the Lord won't give you the victory. Is there anybody in here that can say, I have victory in my hands. I have prosperity in my hands. I have healing in my hands. Well, if you know it's in your hands, you ought to jump to your feet and give God some praise. You ought to tell the Lord, I know it's a plan for my life. I know the Lord is going to bless me real good. So I'm going to use what's in my hands. I'm going to roll my boat. I'm going to work my vision. I'm going to give God some praise. And then I'm going to watch him work. Is there anybody here that knows that the Lord will bless you real good? Come here, Jesus. Jesus even said, I have victory in my hands because he let him put nails in his hands. And he knew that when nails were put in his hands and when he died on Calvary and when he rose from the grave and said, I have all power in heaven and earth in my hands, he knew that we would have the victory. And because Jesus lives, I know there is a plan for my life. Is there anybody in here that knows there is a plan for your life? Shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, there is a plan for your life. Shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, get ready because God is about to move. Shake somebody's hand and say, I want in my hand what you have in your hand because I feel anointing in your hand. I feel prosperity in your hand. I feel glory in your hand. I feel anointing in your hand. Come on and shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, I even feel a praise in your hand for what the Lord is about to do. Can we have some collaborative, interactive church? Can you put your hand in somebody's hand and can you give the Lord some praise and say, neighbor, I'm going to praise him until his plan comes to pass. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until he blesses us real good. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until the walls come down. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until our healing comes. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until the enemy's under our feet. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until our family is healed. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until our child comes home. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until the church becomes prosperous. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until relationships are made whole. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until the streets are cleaned up. Neighbor, we're going to praise him until the glory falls down and just say, neighbor, isn't he worthy? Oh, come on, I said, isn't he worthy? This is what we have, our Baptist Pentecostal Apostolic Church right here. Say, isn't he worthy? Oh, come on and say, isn't he worthy? They say, help me, help me to praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. If you know it's a plan for your life, just give him your best 90-second praise. If you know it's a plan for your life, you ought to praise him right now. You're not there, but you are on your way. is a plan for your life. Don't ever let anyone look at your life and diminish your existence.